Before telling the story of this world record target shooting attempt, it's important to understand a few things about target shooting. Many Americans enjoy the challenge of shooting a rifle to hit a target that's 300, 500, or even a thousand or more yards away. Anything further than 300 yards is considered long range shooting. Long range shooting is a different kind of shooting than when the target is 25 to 100 yards away because many more factors affect the shooter's ability to successfully hit the target. Those factors include wind, humidity, air pressure, and the temperature of the gun barrel. Plus, at these distances, characteristics of the powder charge and the shape, weight, and the material of the bullet itself also contribute. Long-range shooters generally enjoy the challenge that comes with juggling all these variables. I enjoy the challenge and I enjoy the, the, the people and it's generally a good group of people and there's a lot of challenges. It's kind of, kind of a multifaceted sport. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff that, that goes into it. So. What I enjoy about shooting is uh, making the shot, making your efforts work out like they're supposed to. So you have uh, efficiency, safety, ethical placement, a uh, bullet if you're hunting, uh, good groups if you're accuracy. It's just fun to see progression in where I started, you know, eight, nine years ago um, to where I'm at now. So I've just been able to increase my skill and uh, apply things that people have taught me and make changes. Becoming a proficient long-range shooter requires a large amount of discipline and practice. Most long-range shooters believe success requires very high quality equipment as well. Ask a long-range shooter what gun configuration they shoot with and they'll likely list off a laundry list of components and specialized work that add up to a highly customized and personalized gun configuration. It is a Remington XP100 pistol, uh, highly modified with a Macmillan a uh, bench rest pistol stock that yeah, Vortex uh, uh, Razor HD, the, the uh, 4 by uh, or the 5 by 20, I'm sorry. A dual trigger uh, that all standard on bench rest rifles, Schillen Select Match Stainless Barrel, and a Holland Muzzle Brake. Remington Action, uh, detachable box magazine for a 10 round, that really makes a difference when you're shooting competitively. And a Night Force. Scope <clears throat> M24 contour, so it's a really heavy barrel. It's, I've got it down to 24 inches. Uh, EGW 20 minute bases. Uh, An eight, uh, 26 inch barrel. It's a shilling barrel, and it's a light varmint, which means it's a heavy contour. I've got it in a choke stock, which is a precision stock. It's and then a Steiner TX 5 to 25 magnification with a mill dot reticle uh, and mill clicks. That one I've got a a Vortex a PSD EBR1 uh, scope there that does pretty well with that. And the barrels, bolts, receivers, triggers, scopes, bipods, and other accessories that go into a long-range shooter's preferred gun don't come cheap either. It's not uncommon for a dedicated long-range shooter's rig to add up to several thousand dollars. You're not going to show my wife this, are you? Uh, uh, hopefully my wife's not going to be watching. Everybody prefaces that. Um, and I've, I've spent, uh, over the years, I've spent uh, definitely thousands and thousands of dollars on uh, reloading and, and, uh, and guns and scopes and things like that. <laughs> so. The 243, I mean, I bought, I bought the rifle from uh, Cabela's just for the action, for a donor action. Probably paid about four and a half for that. They were asking six. It was a demo, and then I stripped it completely, uh, threw a barrel on it, stock, uh, night force rail, 20 MLA rail, uh, Seekins rings, and the scope. I'm probably into that rifle, you know, I want to say about 27, something like that. I got a lot of bells and whistles, that kind of stuff, but I probably got about you know, seven or 8,000 or so into the rifle and optics and gizmos, gadgets, that kind of stuff. So. 
start adding pieces, they had come in hundreds, hundred dollar bills. So probably three or four thousand dollars for a, a rig up like this. And if a guy was looking at a competitive level bench rest rifle, they would start at five. So it's cheaper than snowmobiles and bass boats. In Antelope Valley, California, lives a long-range shooter named Ernie Jimenez. Okay, my name is Ernest Jimenez and uh, I'm 52 years old. I am recently retired. I uh, retired from Los Angeles Police Department for 29 years, four months. My specialty and my passion is long range. Um, I like that because of its mathematical implications, as bizarre as that sounds. I'm uh, very intrigued with physics, very intrigued with every little aspect, dynamic of what is happening from the moment the primer strikes the projectile until it's, it hits its target. It's just utterly fascinating to me. Ernie is different in a few ways from most other long-range shooters. First, there's his choice of guns. I shoot two different types of rifles. I enjoy black powder muzzle loaders, which is, you know, I like the mid 1800s type uh, rifle. And uh, I also like antique military rifles. Um, I am drawn to military rifles because they generally have a bad reputation. Uh, a lot of people don't feel that they are as good as certain specialty rifles. They believe specialty rifles are so much better at certain things. Um, it's always been my philosophy that uh, military rifles um, can be very, very, very good. And it's always been my belief that really truly makes a rifle accurate is the individual holding it. But uh, this gun is uh, just perfection. It was made in 1950. People who, li who own these rifles either dislike them because they don't like the sight system, they don't like the pull. It's got a, it's called a, a Schmidt Rubin design, a pull, push pull. And um, people, some people don't like that. Additionally, Ernie prefers to shoot at long range targets without a scope. Instead, he uses open sights, or the iron sights built into the gun. My thing is open sights, I really like them. I'm not, nor have I ever been a big fan of scopes, unless it's a necessary tool. Um, and that's just what it is, it's a tool. It's, it's not really a tool, in my opinion, to improve one's accuracy. It, it's more of a, a tool to uh, make sure that you, you you're hitting what you really want to hit. You don't want to hit um, something far out that you're unsure of. Uh, my personal belief is I would not want to have a scope on a rifle if uh, I was shooting for targets. If I was in the military, I would still prefer open sights. Um, but if I was shooting long range targets and there was more of an issue, if if target identification was a factor, then I would I would want to have a scope, um, you know, for clarity. Uh, I grew up as a child in Montana, and uh, I'm the younger of of uh, six kids. And um, my older brothers would hunt frequently with my father. It was always something that I wanted to do. When I was a kid, I used to fantasize about 
having this one particular rifle, a 3030 rifle. And um, I wanted it. I wanted it. I couldn't wait till I turned 13. I was going to get this rifle. And, you know, the pinnacle of life would have been reached for a 13 year old boy. Ernie's shooting was influenced early on by a group of young shooters who treated him poorly when he first went to a shooting range. I was 16. I might have been 17. I was very excited to do it. I, I had never done it before. And I'd gone to a popular shooting range out here. Uh, I was seated next to two, possibly three individuals who I looked at and thought of them as older gentlemen. Um, in hindsight, they were about 24. <laughs> After I had uh, begun shooting, I realized that I was very um, ill-prepared. I was lucky to even hit the target. It was the target's this, you know, 18-inch sheet of paper. And I was hoping for advice, support, that sort of thing. And I was a young, impressionable kid. I was just 16, 17 years old. And these guys actually mocked me. They had made fun of me. And I was uh, extremely bothered by that. Ernie was then motivated to improve his performance on his own. After the experience with the guys, I was not open to asking anyone for help. I began reading stories of people in the past, things that they would do. I would um, take very careful note on things I was doing that would show an increase in my ability to shoot well. And I would take note on things that I would do that would obviously affect it negatively. And I essentially it just became a, a work on fine tuning. The high point of me shooting ever was I was probably 19 years old. My father was healthy enough to go with me to the shooting range. He told me near the end when we were getting ready to leave, I'll tell you what, he goes, I'll bet you if you can hit a quarter at 100 yards, I'll buy you lunch. And I said, no, you're going to buy me lunch if I put 10 consecutive shots through a quarter. Then you're going to buy me lunch. And he laughed and he agreed. I did it. Since then, Ernie practiced shooting frequently, often spending several hours a day on a private range near his home. I have gone shooting with him before, but I don't go now because he stays far too long. <laughs> And it's, he usually goes in the middle of the desert. There's no shade. There's no, he's willing to endure conditions that are not nice, better than I am. <laughs> I'm, I would go shooting with him if he would stay for an hour. <laughs> but it's never an hour, so. I practice three, four times a week. Practice as in shooting. And it's been that way for years. It's like an unsolvable puzzle. I just want to do the best that I can. As Ernie improved, he began to wonder if he could set a world record for open sights long-range shooting. I had applied to Guinness um, because I wanted to learn more about what the current record was, and I wanted to set it. For some reason, I was of the impression that it was 1,420 yards. I decided to contact Guinness and tell them that I wanted to, that I was planning on doing a 1600 yard shoot. In that process, I learned that the record was not 1400 yards, but it was 1120 yards, 1124 yards. So I had been in fact practicing nearly a quarter mile further than what the world record was. Guinness advised me that my practice sessions at 1500 yards would would be the bar that is the current standing record with his practice shots at 1500 yards as the new unofficial world record recognized by guinness ernie decided to challenge himself for a longer distance record the, the current record right now that i'm uh, in the process of getting certified shooting a target a 36 inch target at 2,240 yards, which is 1.27 miles. And 
I am doing it with a unmodified standard issue military rifle uh, that was manufactured in 1950. While Ernie prepared for his world record attempt, other long range shooters weighed in on Ernie's desire to set the world record. I think it's an amazing feat, an amazing thing to be able to do. I wish I could do that. I think it's awesome. Like I said, I, I think it, a lot of it comes down to your equipment and not necessarily the, the most accurate rifle and the most, I mean, you've got to have good sights and really know how to, how to use them. 2,240 yards, an open sight rifle, um, that's incredible. That's, um, that's a feat beyond what I can do. I, you know, I use an optic and I can barely hit you know, the targets out at, at, at range that I'm shooting now. So open sights, that, that's pretty amazing. That, that's a phenomenal feat. I mean, just be able to have the muscle memory, um, to understand the ballistics, and again, an open sight, you know, elevation holdover on that, it's just incredible. Ernie is something special. Um, he's got a tenacity for this that you'd have to have in order to do what he's doing. Um, there's no way that you can, the, the failure rate at trying to do what he's doing is so high. I mean, you're going to miss so much in order to hit what he's doing. And you, you just know that he spent a ton of time behind that rifle, and that's half of it right there. But with everything that I know, what he's doing is incredible. Ernie's world record attempt was scheduled for Memorial Day 2015 at the North Springs Range in Price, Utah. As Ernie arrived at the range that Monday morning, he was met with calm, sunny weather. Nearly perfect conditions for a long-range shoot. The North Springs shooting range does not have a rifle range that extends to the distance Ernie wanted to shoot. To accommodate the shoot, the range was shut down to the public and Ernie was set up to shoot from a bench at the edge of the 1,000-yard rifle range, across and over the rifle ranges and other shooting facilities at a plate of steel shaped like a buffalo. To make the 36-inch buffalo easier to see at 2,240 yards, spotter Mike Paul painted it a bright pink. I coated it all in white and uh, then put the... Uh fluorescent pink that he picked out. I had like three different cans. It was, it was glowing. Mm -hmm. It was a great target to shoot at, but from the line is a dot. <laughs> Tiny little speck. That was impressive. Several people came up to the range to be a part of the world record attempt. Some volunteered to spot for Ernie or identify where shots were landing by looking through spotting scopes. Others just came to witness history being made and support a fellow long range shooter. Uh, my name is Ernie Jimenez. Uh, today is uh, Monday, um, May 25th, Memorial Day, uh, and we are at the uh, North Springs um, shooting range in Utah, and uh, what I'm hoping to do today is to uh, uh, hit uh, repeatedly uh, with open sights uh, the 2,240-yard um, buffalo. It's uh, approximately um, 36 inches and uh, I'm hoping to do so with open sights. It's an unmodified military rifle. There are no changes made to it whatsoever. The only difference is um, I'm using uh, uh, my uh, hand loads, match grade, um, CR Match King 190 grain, and, uh, and that's about it. It was perfect condition to start shooting, and, and he seemed uh, pretty positive, and we all seemed pretty, pro pretty uh, positive that he could get it done. The process Ernie takes on a long range shot like this one long-range shooters are familiar with. He takes a few shots at the target and spotters, watching through powerful spotting scopes, tell him where the shots are landing. Way high. Way high. No way. One, two, three, four, five, six buffalo high. The spotters also yeah. keep Ernie apprised of the weather conditions at the target. By watching a flag placed near the target, they will notify Ernie of the direction and intensity the wind is blowing. He then makes the minor adjustments to his aim, considering all these factors. People who had seen Ernie shoot before expected him to shoot a few feeler rounds to walk him into the target and then hit the target a few times. 
It was expected he might shoot 20 or 30 rounds before scoring several successful hits on the target. However, it became obvious within a few shots things weren't going to go quite so well. The spotters couldn't see where most of Ernie's shots were landing. Usually, when the dirt is dry, it's relatively easy for a spotter to see where a bullet lands when it misses the target. When the spotters could see Ernie's misses, they were close to the target. But when the spotters couldn't see the telltale plumes for shot after shot, Ernie started to get nervous and kept feeling he had to start over and get walked back into the target. Changes in wind direction and velocity made things even more difficult as Ernie continued to try to feel his way toward a path to the target. And then... We began shooting, it started raining again. It's kind of like a vacuum. Um, I'll call it a vacuum when you have, when conditions drop off and just before a storm will come in. Due to the rain, shooting was suspended. Ernie hiked up to the target to see if there were any hits on the target that simply weren't visible through the spotting scopes. Fire. After the brief storm, Ernie settled back in to resume shooting at the pink buffalo that had so far eluded him and his rifle. Once again, he would need to get walked in by the spotters. And as soon as the rain stopped after that first break, we took another 25 shots, and I believe we only spotted about eight of those 25 shots at the most. I might as well have been shooting at the moon because we have no idea where they could still be in the air somewhere. I don't know, but we never saw them land. Wait a minute, before it was blowing right to left, right? Yeah. Correct. Okay, so let me swing it's it back. Down. It's going back that direction right now. Yeah, very little though. It's like, well, it's like 6 o'clock, 6.30. Well, 6.30, 7. And maybe three miles an hour. Ernie continued to shoot, and the spotters continued to see only a portion of the shots, making it near impossible for Ernie to work his way into hitting the target. I brought it left. Nothing? No call. Okay. One of the spotters decided to move to a different location, several hundred yards east, but closer to the target. He was then able to see some of the ground impacts the other spotters couldn't see. He was also close enough to the target, he could hear the telltale ding when it was hit. After Ernie had shot around 100 times at the target, it seemed he finally got a break as the group of spotters, working together, were able to give Ernie the information he needed to achieve his objective. In addition, Ernie was starting to understand the extra variables the weather was adding to the challenge. And I couldn't figure it out. And then I looked up and I realized that a small black cloud was crossing about three quarters down the way. And I thought, oh, it's affecting it. And for some reason I thought to myself, okay, when these little high pressure zones are going across the way, the bullet's gonna rise. So I better put it a little bit low and have it walk right into the target. I don't know why I was thinking that, because the obvious happened, the air is heavier, it's denser, it hit the air, it slowed down, and it went low. So I took a couple shots and they went low, and I remember thinking to myself, I've got this backwards. The spotters called a couple of possible impacts in the next series of shots Ernie made. But, because of how far away the target was, even for the spotter who was closer than Ernie was, it was impossible to visually confirm any impact markings on the target. Higher. Just low, one low. Oh, one wow. Low, low. These are the highest I've shot them. After Ernie had shot 149 bullets at the target, a group made their way up to the target to discover if, in fact, the target had been hit. 
So we packed up all our stuff where it was safe, and uh, the entire crew, we, we drove uh, about 800 yards away from the target, and then we walked all the way up the target. And I, I have to admit, I was absolutely trying my hardest to just look, you know, yeah, cool. You know, it's great, no big deal. But I'll tell you, inside my head, I was completely cooking off on that walk. The thing that had me worried as I was, I was walking up the hill is everyone was so confident that I had struck the target. They all had the opportunity to look through a scope. I was the only one of that entire group that at no time had the opportunity of looking through a scope. I was walking up there and I didn't want to turn to anybody and say, hey, are you sure I hit it? You're sure, right? I didn't want to look like that. So I just kept my mouth shut. And I'll tell you, that was an 800 yard hike up the hills and I thought it was eternity. I was, I was sick to my stomach. I, I, I had actually convinced myself as I was approaching the, approaching the hill that we were gonna approach the buffalo and there were no hits. And then I was gonna find a good cliff and think about jumping off of it. <laughs> no, I would have felt like that, but I didn't. But that's, that's how it went. When Ernie and the others reached the target, they discovered the target had been hit, not once, but four times. Reviewing the video footage from the cameras near the target showed that the target was hit four times during the last string of 25 bullets Ernie shot. Everyone, including Ernie, was pleased to see that the target had been struck. Ernie was concerned, however, about one of the hits. When I got there and uh, I first realized that I, I had actually hit it, I, I, saw, I saw a keyhole. Uh, in the center of the buffalo. The keyhole indicated that the bullet was tumbling end over end in the air and hit the target sideways. Ernie's confidence in the Sierra Match King bullets he had hand loaded was in question. He had believed that the 190 grain bullet was remarkably stable and would never keyhole. My entire belief system and everything that, that, that I've always held in my heart and I honestly mean this about the Sierra Match Kings is that they are the most perfect bullet through that phase. And if I would have hit, it doesn't matter at 1500 yards and, or, or 20, uh, what was it? 2240. Um, the first one's a keyhole. It defeats everything I've been trying to prove with the Sierra bullets. Yeah, I might've got the record, but the bullets are keyholing. It wasn't until Ernie was later able to watch close-up video taken from a camera near the target that the mystery of the keyhole was solved. When I finally had a chance to review the close-up footage taken of that shot, I realized that the bullet had landed right between his legs and ricocheted upwards, which would have 100% changed it from a keyhole to a uh, ricochet. I feel good about this. Um, I, uh, you know always wish you could do better, but um, I'd like to, uh, to do it again. <laughs> I just love to shoot. Guinness has essentially three methods that you can go through. First two involving paying them, they're quite expensive, or the third option is to um, have the required persons that they say ought to be present, specific experts um, in certain fields, have them present and have them, you know, say uh, everything was legit. That was the third process, and that's the process that I uh, opted for. So I had submitted the paperwork. 
I had taken care of everything I needed to take care of prior to the event and I should have had the packet back from Guinness roughly six weeks before the event took place. A month before the event, I still had not received the packet, so I began telephoning and sending emails to Guinness, and I actually had a dialogue going back and forth with them. They would advise me that they were going to get the package out, and I would have it before the shoot. And finally, right up until the day before the event, I still had not received the package, but I was in contact with persons from Guinness, and they advised me that they were going to send the packet out immediately and that it would arrive after I completed the event and to go ahead and proceed with the event as scheduled. Almost a week later, the packet arrived at my house. I looked at it and the packet said uh, that the target needed to be a square target of 10 inches. I contacted them and I was advised to send in everything I had. Uh, as it was done, they would look into everything and come back with their analysis. And now seven months have gone by and a week ago I received an email saying that the application had been denied because according to the letter prior to the event I was notified that the target had to be a 10 inch square target. I contacted Guinness about the mistake and I advised them that they didn't notify me of anything like that until after the event took place and I advised them of the ongoing dialogue that I had been that had been taking place with Guinness prior to the event, and they are now reviewing it um, again, and I'm again in limbo. Yeah, I'll. I don't know. I'll see what happens. I, I just I feel optimistic. I I the people at Guinness have been really good and they, so far they have been very fair. Um, I'd be really disappointed if it turned out that they would make a retroactive change after the event. The event takes place and then after the event they decide it's not going to qualify because they come up with the target after the event took place. So it just doesn't, it doesn't seem fair or uh, it doesn't make any sense. And I gave them heaps of information and I was very sure to document it in my line of work and everything. I'm very, very careful and, uh, about any kind of correspondences I have. And I was fortunate that I saved everything that I, that I did. And just every day I check the email several times a day, hoping that I hear something. And hopefully sooner the, sooner the better. Keep my fingers crossed. Thank you.